All right, so let's see. All right, let's try that one. So it's going to ask, uh, basically it's going to ask us for the domain first. So let's find the domain of that function. Test. That was that was good. That was very good. I think I think that's the most A's and B's I remember in a pre-calculus class. So that's good. That is good. I'm hoping this whole iPad lectures on the YouTube solve the homework stuff works because I invested some funds in it <laughs> and uh, some time. So I'm hoping it's helpful. All right. So how do we find the domain? What do we do? We grab the denominator, right? We say, Hey, denom, you can't be zero. Right? Remember, domain is asking what you're allowed to plug in and not cause a problem. Right? And what causes problems is anything making that denominator zero. Right? So we say, okay, denominator, you can't be zero. Now, how do you solve that? What do you do? You can factor it. That's one good way. Or you can just bump it over. And what would I do to uh, turn that into x, solve for x there? Fourth root it. Yeah, you can just fourth root it. So let me do that. Fourth root, fourth root. And when you do an even root, what do you have to do? <coughs> Plus or minus. You guys aware of the fact that you have to do that with an even root and not with an odd? Why? Because Mr. Heron says so. No, that's not a good reason. Think about, think about if you had x cubed equals 8, for example. What, what are the, what's the real answer? Aside from all fancy techniques or whatever, what, you tell me. You know, you can just look at that and you know the answer, right? What can you put in there? What to the third power is 8? 2. I'm just proving you what about the odd roots here for a second on the side, right? 2 to the third power, 2 times 2 times 2 is 8, and only 2. Not ne you wouldn't do plus or minus. That would be wrong. Negative 2 to the third power is not 8. <coughs> you with me? Negative 2 to the third power would be negative 8, right? Because 3 negatives would be negative, right? So do you see my point? If I was to say, if I was to come in here and go, oh, you just, you just cube root both sides, and don't forget the plus or minus, the plus or minus is wrong for an odd root. You wouldn't put the plus or minus. It's just, you could do the cube root, but no plus or minus. It's just two. It's just positive two, not negative. But for even, for even powers, for which we do even roots, it's plus or minus, right? For x to the four, this is going to come out this is going to come out plus or minus 3, isn't it? Because even powers bury negative signs, don't they? Negative 3 or positive 3 to the fourth power is 81, isn't it? You guys with me on that? Right? 3 times 3 is 9. Right? 4 threes. 3 times 3 is 9. 3 times 9. 9 times 9 is 81, huh? Even if they're all negative. Because if they're all negative, it's still positive 81 in the end, isn't it? So four negative threes or four positive threes, either way. So, long story short, even root plus or minus needed for an even root. Okay, anyway, so that was, so x, oh, this should, I lost the not equals, huh? x cannot be plus or minus three. So that's the domain. x can be anything, but it can't be plus three and it can't be minus three. Any other numbers are fine. Those two will choke the denominator. Well, they'll, they'll make the denominator zero, thus choking the function, making it undefined. Good to there? Good so far? Now, there's other questions in this, on this very same problem. Whoops. So still staying with this problem. Um, they, the next <coughs> part B, what they're going to ask us, so part A was the domain. Part B is going to say, what's the uh, vertical asymptote? Remember those? Let me give you a second. See what you remember. How do we find a vertical <coughs> asymptote? <clears throat> yeah, pretty much the same thing we just did, huh? It's, it's almost exactly like domain, except instead of saying denominator not equal to zero, you say denominator equal to zero, because you want to know where are the vertical asymptotes, where does it equal, right? Den you're, you're, so basically... At vertical asymptotes, you're not allowed to go there, huh? You're not allowed to touch it. That's why in part A, 
we said denominator not equal to zero because it's not in the domain, but part B equal to zero because it is a vertical asymptote. So it's going to be the same answer. It's going to be x is plus or minus 3, just like it was before, but now equal instead of not equal, right? We good? You can never touch a vertical asymptote. Part C, horizontal oblique, which means diagonal, right? Asymptotes. Horizontal oblique, okay. So can you take that thing and find the horizontal oblique? Let me give you a second, see if you remember how to do that. Anybody got an idea? What do we do? How do we find the horizontal and or oblique? Horizontal or oblique. It's all about the numerator and denominator power. Remember that? It's like a tug of war between the numerator and the denominator. Because when you're, when you're looking for a horizontal or diagonal asymptote, you're basically saying, hey, as I go way off to the right, does the function like level out or do something like that? What does it do? way off to the right, like when I plug in, like when the x is 1,000 or 10,000 or a million, you know, way off to the right. Well, if you're plugging in really, really big x values, think about it. If I plug in 1,000 here and 1,000 there, the minus 64 and the minus 81 are just chump change. They're nothing. They don't matter at all, right? 1,000 squared is a million, and 1,000 to the fourth is crazy big. Trillion? It's a trillion. Yeah, so, um, so, yeah, it's a trillion. So, so there's going to be a million <coughs> minus 64 over a trillion minus 81. I mean, it's basically a million over a trillion, right? It's all that's going to matter is the most powerful term on the top and the most powerful term on the bottom when you go way off to the right, which is what we're asking when we're saying does it level off way off to the right. Oh, and the left is the same thing, right? Negative 1,000, negative a million, same, same thing. So way off to the ends... Does it level off? Well, the numerator power is 2. The denominator power is 4. They have a tug of war, right? The numerator is trying to pull the function up, trying to make it go up like this. The denominator function is pulling it flat, right? Denominators, right? When you divide by a big number, it brings the total down, right? So the denominator is trying to pull it down. Numerator is trying to pull it up. They're having a tug of war. Who's going to win? Denominator is more powerful. What does it mean when the denominator is more powerful? He wins. This, in other words, if you reduce this, it's like 1 over x squared, huh? Right? That's what I'm, I'm, I'm giving you two perspectives. You can, I gave you those rules, numerator, denominator. And I said if denominator is bigger, it's going to be what? Y equals zero. 0. Horizontal asymptote. Now that's because, giving you the other perspective, it's basically x squared over x Reduce it, it's 1 over x squared. And then if you plugged 1,000 into that, or a million or a billion or whatever, 1 over 1,000 squared <coughs> is 1 over a million. If I gave you 1 millionth of a cookie, I, I just see it's like a part of a crumb, right? I basically gave you no cookie. That's why it's y equals 0. That's basically 0. The denominator pulls it and flattens. So that graph is going to come down to 0. y equals 0 is actually the horizontal asymptote. Make sense? Remember all that? All good? And then um, I believe I believe that's the whole question, isn't it? Yeah, yeah the last one. So that would just be graphing calculator, so I won't bother that. The part D is just enter the thing in your graphing calculator. So there, we're working together the horizontal asymptote and vertical <laughs> asymptote information with technology. So you know where the horizontal and vertical asymptotes are, and then you use technology. Mine's a, my graph's a big mess. So let, me, let me put on the graph what we know. What do we know? What do we know from our by hand work? We know at x is positive 3, there's a vertical. And at x is negative 3, there's a vertical. So what I'll ask you on the next test. I'll say, show me the by hand stuff. Show me the asymptotes right on the graph. And was 0 is an asymptote, right? y equals 0. So we know that. And then you let the graphing calculator tell you the rest. Is that good? That makes sense. Questions I can answer on all that? We get there. There's word problems at the end of this section, so I've got to watch my time. I can't do too many of these easier ones. There's a lot of hard ones before us. All right, let's do uh, part A of the domain. Go ahead and find the domain. <coughs> I'll give you five seconds, literally. What's the domain? Five. Boom, right? 
Domain is denominator not equal to 0. x minus 5 can't be 0. x can't be 5. Anything but 5. The domain can be any. You can plug anything into that function you want, except not 5. All right, that's part A. Part B, what's the vertical asymptote? Go ahead, give you just a second. Is the answer x equals 5? Yes. <coughs> I'm tricking you. Yeah, remember for the verticals, you have to factor top and bottom and see if it reduces. You don't have to do that for domain. Remember, first factor. I know there's so much to remember, huh? First factor and reduce, if possible. Then denominator equal to zero. So if I factor x squared plus x minus 20 over x minus 5, that top is, um, yeah, it's, let me write FOIL here. Remember how to factor? When you do FOIL, you're looking for uh, two numbers that multiply to be 20. And what, what number's in the middle of x squared plus x minus 20? There's a 1 there, a plus 1, huh? So what numbers multiply to be 20? 4 and 5, or 5 and 4, doesn't matter what order. Is that good? 4 times 5 is 20. And how can they add to be plus 1? The sign in the middle? I always tell my algebra students, that's just a mantra. Sign in the middle on the bigger every time. Sign in the middle is plus, then the bigger. Who's bigger, 5 or 4? He gets the plus. The sign in the middle is taken by the bigger every time. Sign in the middle is taken by the bigger, right? Because plus 5 minus 4 is plus 1, right? They have to add to be the middle, and they multiply to be the one on the right. Positive 5, negative 4 is negative 20. See how it's all working? That right, good? So, again, if you're rusty on that, I'd be glad to help you come off stairs, go see Roberto. But you do need to be a good factorer to make it through this class, especially to make it in calculus. Make sure you're getting more and more comfortable. If you're not sure, just foil those out, foil those out, foil those out. And the more you do that, you'll become a better factorer. Because factoring is just foiling backwards, right? So the more you foil forwards, the better you'll be able to think backwards about foil. All right, so, um, oh, nothing cancels. I was sure it did. Nothing cancels. So that was all for nothing. What a waste of time. Nothing cancels. So, yeah, it is just grab the denominator, say, hey, denominator, you're zero, so it is x equals 5. So I just tricked myself. So, yeah, it's just x equals 5. It was all a waste of time. It would have mattered if something canceled, right? If something cancels and there's not really a vertical there, although there is still a domain problem. Does that make sense? Notice I don't factor in part A for the domain, right? Because if you're making the bottom zero, you're still the problem. I don't care if you cancel out. You're really there, and you're causing the problem, and you're at not allowed in the domain. But for part B, vertical, if something cancels out, then it's not going to really make a vertical asymptote. Anyway, it doesn't cancel. It's x equals 5. So, okay, we need to go on to part C, or, yeah, part C, and ask the question, what is the horizontal or oblique asymptote? So we have y equals x. Remember what you do for horizontal oblique. Just take the highest power on the top and the highest power on the bottom, right? And really you can just reduce, because really that's effectively what's happening. For a horizontal, you're saying, what happens is I go way off to the right and I plug in like 1,000. What's this function doing way off to the right? Well, all that's going to matter is the most powerful term in the top and the most powerful term in the bottom. The other, other ones will not matter when you're plugging in gigantic numbers. All that will matter is the most powerful term, right? Does that make sense? If I say, hey, guys, I got 1,000 squared minus 1,000. That's a million. It's a million. 1,000 squared is a million. Take away 1,000, that's nothing. That's nothing, right? All that matters is the most powerful term on the top and the bottom. So then reduce it, that's basically x, huh? That's x to the first. What does that mean? Linear, oblique, slant, diagonal. Meaning, it's going to go like this. It's going to head, as you go off to the right forever, the graph is going to follow a dotted, slant, diagonal asymptote line. Why? Because <coughs> when you, it's like x squared over x, right? Most powerful term, top and bottom, and then reduce that, it's x to the first. x to the first means linear. Now, careful, I don't mean the answer is exactly x to the first. I think, I think it actually is on this one. But it isn't always. 
How do you actually, I'm just saying it's like x to the first. It is a first power something. But I've got, you know, it's mx plus b of some kind. But I don't know what the slope is. I don't know what the b is. I think in this one it is just x, but it's not always. How do we find out what it actually, specifically is? Denominator into numerator. You've got a long divide. So denominator, x minus 5 into numerator, x squared plus x minus 20. Is that good? Here we go, right? You like this? These are painful, aren't they? So you put, what do you put up here? Times the front that'll match the front. Everybody hearing me on that again? So for these long divisions of denominator into numerator, whatever you put up top, times the front to match the front. What times x will be x squared? Well, x. It's plain old x. Times x will be x squared. But it also hits that one. Minus 5x. Good so far? You multiply, you, you FOIL, distribute, through both of these two. Right? You distribute through both. Whatever you put up here hits them both. x times x, x squared, x times minus 5, minus 5x. Five Good so far. And then we subtract, don't we? Subtract. x squared minus x squared, gone. That should always happen. That's perfect. Don't you multiply the whole thing by negative 1? There's another, let, me, let me address that in a second. So let's finish this up. You're right. You're right. But it's, I'm going to say it a different way. So now what's... So I, the, the x squared minus x squared, that's gone. Okay, now what about this minus this? Good. Positive 6x. Bring down the minus 20. Everybody see that? Because it's plus x minus minus 5. Yeah, that minus, you're subtracting this whole bottom row, huh? So watch out. It's really easy to mess up. Plus x minus minus 5. It's actually plus 5. So it makes 6, huh? Right? 1x. Plus 5, yeah. And so what you're saying about multiply the bottom by negative 1, that's, a, that's another nice, easy way to go. And that's the effect, right? When you're subtracting the whole bottom row, it's the same as just multiplying the bottom row by negative 1 and add it. That's another option. Yeah. Either way you want to go. Somehow you have to remember, you're subtracting that whole bottom row, so it's going to reverse all the signs. Good? One more step. We're not done yet. Next, well, what can we put here? That'll multiply the front and match the front. What times front <laughs> matches front? What right here times x will make 6x. Plus 6. Plus 6. No, you want an exact same match. And then when you subtract, they'll drop out. You want it identical at first. Identical in every way. Same sign, same everything. At first, and then when you subtract, that's what will make them zero out, right? If they were opposite and you subtracted, they wouldn't zero out. So you want them the same. So plus 6 times both that. So 6x minus 30. Subtract them. You know, I'm done. The rest is remainder. Who cares about the remainder? There's my, there's my um, diagonal asymptote line. Y equals x plus 6. So it wasn't just y equals x. It was y equals x plus 6. So really, I wrote it in the wrong spot. I was just guessing. It's really up here at 6, isn't it? That's the, uh, that's the slant or diagonal asymptote line that the graph of, whoops, what just happened? <coughs> that the graph eventually will follow. Is that good on that? So when do you get a slant or diagonal, oblique, asymptote line? When the power on the top, when the numerator is bigger than the denominator by one, huh? That's what it said in my table of rules, right? Well, it's bigger than more by one, more than one. Yeah, good question. Let's do another one. Um, I, I don't know. Yeah, to give you the rule, just think about what would happen if you reduced it and you plugged it in. All right, let's try this one real quick. Whoop, this is fitting on the screen. Yeah, okay. Um, can I just jump to the vert horizontal? You guys can do the rest, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, well, maybe I'll just do it quick. So, part one, domain. I'll just scribble it out. Domain. What's the domain? Negative. Cannot be negative eight, right? <laughs> What's the vertical asymptote? It equals 8, right? But not negative 8. I mean, negative 8. Okay, now let's go on to the horizontal oblique. All right, let me give you a second. Try the horizontal oblique. Remember what you do. Imagine if the whole top was multiplied out and the whole bottom was foiled out, right? Multiply it out, foiled out, whatever, right? Foil out the whole top. X times X minus 12 squared. X. I don't mean you have to actually foil it out, but just imagine if you did. What would be the most powerful term on the top? The x cubed. What about the bottom? Also x cubed, right? You guys with me on that? 
which is 1. So that's it. Y equals 1. Horizontal line. That's a horizontal asymptote at Y equals 1. Right? That makes sense? Because the tug of war is going to end in a tie. Right? As you go way out to the right and plug in like a thousand, you're going to get a thousand cubed. Over a thousand cubed, you're going to get one. They're going to tie. So that graph is eventually, I don't know if it's coming from the top or the bottom or what, but it's eventually going to approach a height of one. Does that make sense? Not confusing? David, are you happy with that? Yes. You sure? You look like you have a question. Can I answer a question? Uh, that was the horizontal oblique. All right. That's what, we're doing, that's what we're doing there? Yeah, horizontal oblique, yeah. So for horizontal oblique, right, we just take highest power at the top, highest power at the bottom, when it was multiplied out. And then just reduce that fraction. You just wanted to know the powers. Just the power, just most powerful term in the top, most powerful, because that's all that matters, right, if you plug it in like a thousand. The smaller powers are going to fade into oblivion, right, if you plug in a big enough number, right? If you're a billionaire, you don't care about losing a thousand bucks, right? What, what was the difference between that one and the one where it was a diagonal? Yeah, good question. One where it was diagonal had a, a higher power on the top by one. So if this was x to the fourth over x to the third, then that reduced to be x to the first, and then that would be diagonal, because that's linear. That's mx plus b. Does <coughs> so everybody see that difference? A good question, right? So if the top is higher power, wins the tug of war by one, then when you reduced it, you're going to get x to the first power. And that's linear. That's what, that's what a line is, is an x to the first power kind of thing, right? So those are diagonal. Those are the oblique asymptotes. So if the top is higher than the bottom by one, then those are diagonal. And then to find those, though, you still have to long divide denominator into numerator. But ours came out equal, top and bottom same. So that totally just cancels, and it's just 1. On the official rules, I said if the numerator equals denominator, it's just y equals a over b. That's what I wrote in the rules. Where a and b are the leading coefficients, which is 1 over 1. That's the a and the b. It's the coefficients in front of the most powerful terms. So that's it. Question? Good? We all happy? All right. Let's. Um, you know, I I want to do part one first. Domain. So the domain you'd have to factor that, huh? That looks painful to factor. Take a nine out. Good idea. X squared. Does nine go to eighty nine? No, nine doesn't go to eighty nine. Bad idea. <laughs> Nine, I, well, I thought I was happy too because 9 goes to 72, but it's going to 89. Huh? So we got to factor this thing. This one's bad. I'm thinking 9 because I'm looking at that 72 and that 89 in the middle to get a big middle term. Remember, you're looking for FOIL. What multiplies to be 72 and adds somehow in the middle? It's really FOIL. Right? It's FOIL. So 9x times x. Um, so I'm, I'm just thinking out the multiplication right now. Um, now, 9 times 8 for 7. Use your calculator. It's okay if you're rusty on some of those times. Just use your calculator. 9 times 8 makes 72, but you can't have two 9s in the same parenthesis. Why not? Because you could factor a 9 out if you had that. Well, so what? Why is that the end of the world? Because if you could factor a 9 out, I would have done it on step 1. I couldn't do it on step 1, then it can't be showing up later. Right? If, it, if they don't have a 9 in common, they don't have a 9 in common. It can't be later. So do you see why when you're doing the FOIL thing, you're never going to have two numbers that have anything in common, let alone the same number? in the same parentheses, because that would be a common piece. <laughs> and we get the common stuff out on step one before we ever get to the FOIL thinking, right? So, um, so it's not 9 and 9, but maybe they'll switch the order. It could, be, it could be 8 here, 9 there. That's possible. I don't know what the signs are yet. So how do I, so do you see how I'm thinking? If you're rusty, I know a lot of people are rusty. I wish I had like a whole hour just to review you on factoring. It is important. You've got to do that for yourself. Front times front to be front. Last times last to be last. Other than signs, I don't care about signs. So far, so good. Now, how do you know the, the middle is always the hard part? How do you get the middle? Oi. That's the middle of the word foil. O-I. What does O stand for? Outer with outer. 81. What does I stand for? Inner with inner. 8. Now, can they make 89? Oh, yeah, beautiful. 81 and 8. If they're, and they want them both negative because you want a minus 89. So make them both negative. They make minus 89, don't they? See how I figured that out? It's the oi, the outer, outer, inner, inner makes the middle, doesn't it? Everybody good with that? I know everybody's not normally good with that in these classes. I know it's a hard part. 
So everybody see how I did that? I notice I put the signs on at the end when I'm doing this middle section, right? I don't worry about signs. There's too much to worry about at first, right? Just put the signs on at the very end. Minus 8 and minus 81 is minus 89. So there it is. Set that not equal to 0. So that means 9x minus 8 can't be 0. And x minus 9 can't be 0. Am I on the screen? Yeah. So x cannot be 9. Jump this one over. 9x cannot be 8. Divide by the 9. Boom. So x cannot be 8 ninths or 9. Anything else is fine. Those are the two values that make the denominator 0. That was a lot of work for that one. So that's just part 1. So that was the domain. You guys okay? They flushed it off too which, quick. Get that? Which one is the answer? A? That was just, oh, which one? Yeah. It cannot be 8, 9, and 9, right? Yeah, it looks like A to me. Uh-huh. Because it can be 0, right? No, it could be 0. Zero's not a problem. Plug in yeah, 0. Yeah, yeah, it can be 0. Okay. Yeah, yeah, right. It can be Oh, yeah, I hear you. I hear you, David. Yeah, you're right. Eight, zero's not a problem. All right. 8, ninths and 9 are problems. They would make the denominator 0. Exactly. We good with that? All right, let's try now to do part B. Part B asks for the vertical. Now, for the vertical, you've got to factor the top also, right? Remember, step one is factor. Something might reduce. I don't know. This one's such a pain. 3x squared minus 5x. I normally try to skip these hard ones and just let you do them in the homework. I'm kidding. But uh, <laughs> I just don't have time for everything. It's always my problem. What was it? Both <laughs> minus? Is that right? Yeah, okay. So I've got to factor that top now. It's another foil. I know it's a hard one for a lot of people. So what's going to make that work? I don't know. In fact, maybe I'll do it down here. So, so the bottom. So I've already got the, the denominator is 9x minus 8, x minus 9 from last last part. Okay, so what's the top? Um Nothing in common, nothing is in common to 36, 5. 5 is a problem, right? So anyway, front times front to be front. What times what's 36? Well, a lot of things. 6 times 6, 4 times 9. How do you know what's going to work? You just start guessing. 6 times 6. It's usually the numbers closer together, but it might be 4, 9. I don't know. might be 3, 12. might be 2, 18. Probably not. It's probably not those farther apart numbers. It's usually 4, 9, or 6, 6. I bet. Let's see. 24. Now, what? so I did that one. What times what's 24? 3 times 8, 4 times 6. Now, we can't do 4 and 6. Why not? Because, look, th these two would have a 6 in common, but, but these, so that can't be, remember, nothing in common in the same parentheses, because we, we get all the commonness out, if we look for it, in step 1, before we ever get to the foil. So there cannot be commonness later. Not only that, 6 and 4 have a problem. They have 2 in common. Nothing in common. Not allowed. So it's not 4, 6. So could it be 3, 8? No. No. Why not 3, 8? Because the 3 and the 6 and the 6 and the 8 have 2 in common. It's not 3 and 8. Um, what else multiplies to be 24? 2 and 12. Could it be 2 and 12? No, a bunch of commonness again. Could it be 1 and 24? No way. There's 6 in common. So the 6 and 6 are a problem. Everybody see how I figured that out real quick? Every other combo has stuff in common. So it's not 6 and 6. It's probably 3 and, well, 4 and 9. Yeah, it's got to be 4 and 9, huh? I mean, I think. It's probably 4 and 9. nine. The order of the first two doesn't matter, 9, 4, 4, 9, whatever. But then the order on the back two will matter. Okay, now what about, let's go back to the back two. What times what's 24? Well, how about 4 and 6 again? No, a bunch of stuff in common, huh? How about if we switch them? How about if we go 6 and 4? No, 4 and 6 have 2 in common. Don't even try it. No way. All right? It's not 4 and 6 in either order. 3 and 8? Could it be 3 and 8? Could it be 8 here, 3 there? No. No, a bunch of stuff in common. See, this really helps. This really cuts down the possibilities. Could it be three here, eight there? That's a possibility. That's probably it, huh? Let's do now. No signs yet. Too much to worry about. No signs yet, right? I've just finally got front times front making front, and last times last making last, and nothing in common in the parentheses. It's my first legitimate attempt that might have a chance. How do you know? Oi, inner, inner, outer, outer. What's the two inner? 27. What's the two outer? Four times eight. 32. Can 32 and 27 make negative 5? Absolutely they can. Sign in the middle <coughs> goes on the bigger. Now, careful about what I mean by bigger. I don't mean bigger down here yet. It might be. I mean bigger among those two numbers you just formed. So 32 and 27. Who's the bigger among 32 and 27? Mm -hmm. 32. So he's the negative. Sign in the middle negative, sign in the bigger negative. So how do you know who he goes? Well, he goes on that one because minus 8 times 4 
and he goes on that one. Whew, all of that, and they do cancel. That, that, it mattered. In the end, it mattered. For the, I should have guessed it at the beginning, huh? Because they, they, they're probably likely to do that. So yeah, it canceled. So it's 4x plus 3 over x minus 9. So the only <laughs> vertical is x is 9. That's the only vertical. It's not the other one. Everybody see that? So again, for domain, we don't factor. For verticals, we do. Because if something drops out, it's dropped out. It's not a vertical. But it is still a domain problem. That was a lot of work, and I didn't even want to do that part. All right. So that's a lot of factoring. So anyway, what I really wanted to get to was the horizontal oblique. Maybe that's becoming the easier part. All right, horizontal oblique, what do you do? Highest power in the top, highest power in the bottom, right? 36x squared over 9x squared. Reduce it. What is it? 4. four. It's y <laughs> equals 4. Boom. Yeah, that's the easy part, huh? It's a horizontal line at a height of 4. As the, well, the graph comes up, maybe it comes down, I don't know. It draws close to that line. Good? All right, I'm going to flash that off. You got All right, number 10. So y equals x plus 52 over x cubed. You must make into one fraction. So when you have, so that's the trick on this one, and it was the same way on the um, number, number 9. When you've got two separate things added like that, you must make them into one big fraction. Because all the rules I'm giving you about numerator power, denominator power, and all that, factor of the denominator, set it equal zero, and all that, that's all assuming it's one big fraction. We can't have two separate things. We've got to put them together. So how do we put these two together? You put that one over one, right? Make it look like a fraction when you've got a whole number or a whole letter. Put it over one. And then what? We've got to make the bottoms the same, don't we? To add two fractions, you've got to make the bottoms the same. How do I make the bottoms the same? Yeah, multiply top and bottom by x cubed. Then they're both going to have x. So this will be what? x to the fourth over x cubed plus 52 over x cubed. Everybody see what I did there? I multiplied top and bottom by x cubed. So x cubed times x is x to the fourth on the top. Now they have the same denominator, don't they? So now, put them together. Now you can make it one big fraction. x to the fourth plus 52 over x cubed. Now, can I just go dot, dot, dot? All the rest of the steps are fine. Denominator zero and horizontal asymptote and vertical asymptote and everything is just like we've been doing. But you've got to first make it one big fraction. Now, that would be like the numerator one. Yeah, so what, yeah, what kind of, uh, this one's going to be oblique, isn't it? It's going to be diagonal. Asymptote, isn't it? Because the, the top is one, one higher than the bottom in power. Exactly. Exactly. All right. So you don't want to waste your time doing stuff you don't need to do. So, yeah, so on this one, number 11, and I think 12 and 13, um, they only want you to find the min. So, in other words, just put y1 equals x plus 8 over x. You don't need to get common denominators or any of that. They're not asking the normal battery of questions about horizontal asymptote, vertical asymptote, denominator. They're not asking any of that. They're just saying, hey, graph it and find the min for us. Find the minimum value. So we just go, all right, I'm not going to mess with common denominators or any of that. Just type that into your calculator, graph it, and find the min. That's all you got to do. Is that good? So don't waste your time with any of that other stuff. All right, rectangular area adjacent to a river. Fenced in. No fence is needed on the riverside. The enclosed area is 1,000 square feet. Fencing for the side parallel to the river is $6 per foot. Fencing the other two sides is $3 per foot. Four corner posts of 35 each. Let X be the length of one side perpendicular to the river. Sounds complex. Not that bad. There's the river. I'm pretty artistic, huh? All right. So there's the river. So we're going to fence around that river. They're basically saying we're going to go like that. You know, we're going to put three sides, a fence, and then there's the river on the other side. It's supposed to hold in small children that we can't get out 
or they could just drown in the river. I'm kidding. It's clearly for animals, right? So we're fencing in for critters, for animals. Three sides and the river is, serves as a fence on the other side. So what's the cheapest way to make this happen? What's the cheapest way? Well, what are they telling us? They're saying the enclosed area is 1,000 square foot. So the area, let me just write these facts down, is going to be 1,000 square feet. That means like all this space, right? But we're going to make a pin. So suppose you've got, you, you know you need 1,000 square feet for your animals. 1,000 square feet for animals. All right, so next, fencing for the side parallel to the river is $6 per foot. Parallel, that's this side, huh? $6 per foot. Right, this side is parallel to the river, right? Fencing for the other two sides is $3 per foot. Good on that? Cheaper fencing on those two sides? And then it says um, the four corner posts are $35 each. That's these four corner posts. Those are $35 each. That's just four times 35. And then let X be the length of one of the sides perpendicular to the river. So this is X and this is X. Are you tracking with me? X is how long these sides perpendicular to the river are, right? They're both X. Is that good? Now, what's the other side, though? I don't know how long this side is. Right, call it Y. Call it Joe. I'm just giving it a name. Right, I don't know what it is. I'm calling it Y. The other two they told me to call X. All right, and what do they want? They want a cost function. They want me to write cost, so here we go. Cost equals? How are you going to figure out the cost there? What's the cost of this top part? 3X. Everybody get that? Because it's X feet, $3 per foot. The bottom part's also 3X. And what's the right side? 6Y, $6, $6 per foot times Y feet. What are, we, what are we leaving out? One other thing in the cost. Post. The post, 4 times 35. Right? There's four posts at $35 each. So the cost, then, is 6X plus 6Y plus that 140. Good? But there's one problem. It's supposed to be C of X, they told me. They don't want Y. Whenever they say C with parentheses X, you know that all through the rest of whatever math classes you take. Whenever they put like a certain letter in the parentheses, that means that's the only letter they want over here. The numbers are right. You keep the 140, but we don't want that Y. Only X is the only letter on the right side. So what I got to get rid of the Y. We've done this before. This is nothing new, huh? Right? When we type into our calculator, we have to get rid of the Y, don't we? So how do we do it? How do we always get when we have an X and a Y, and we don't want the Y? We've got to have something else to plug in. A sub, we've got to have another equation that we sub into this one, huh? So what other fact is up there on the screen that we have not used yet? Area is 1,000. Yeah, what's area of any rectangle? What's the total space inside any rectangle? It's length times width or x times y, whatever you want to call it. It's one side times the other for the area inside of a rectangle, huh? So there's our other equation. Take that thing and solve for y, so divide by x on both sides. y is 1,000 over x. Grab that and um, 1,000 over x. And plug that in for y right there. Because y equals 1,000 over x. So what do we get? 6x plus 6 times 1,000 over x plus 140. Does that make sense? There is an equation with only x and numbers. Let me clean that up a little bit. When you have a whole number, 6, interacting with a fraction, put it in 6 over 1, right? Goes to the top, so it becomes 6,000 over x. Plus 140. There it is. They're going to have you go on and type, <coughs> type that into your calculator eventually, and the other parts, Y1, and then graph it, and then find the uh, minimum, because that's the lowest cost, the way to build the fencing to save as much money as possible. Make sense on that? 
questions? We good? All right. So. All right, so we got that box there, and it wants me to express the surface area of the box as a function for x. So how do we do that? Surface area. How many sides are there all together for that box? Six, Six huh? There's the top, and there's the bottom. There's the left, and there's the right. There's the front, and there's the back. There's six sides. So we have to find a formula for the area of each of those sides. They're all rectangles, huh? And then add them all up. And that'll be the whole surface, right? So what's the top? Here's the top, right there. Top is a rectangle. What are the sides of the top? And then here's the bottom. Yeah, they're both x squared, aren't they? They're both just x times x, right? Because for a rectangle, again, it's one side times the other side. Good so far? Now let's uh, do the left. What's the left side and the right side? Those are x, y, aren't they? Because y is the height. Huh? So those, the left is x, y, and the right is x, y. Good there. And now, what's the front? Here's the front. And then there's the back. So what, how much is the front? What, what are the dimensions on the front? It's also x, y, right? Because this y here is, the, is this side, and this is x. So x, y in the back is the same, also x, y. So all the sides, except for the top and bottom, are x, y, aren't they? They're all x in the bottom, y in the height. So what do we get? 2x squared plus 4x, y. We good to there? That's the surface area formula, but... What's my problem? It's supposed to only have x. Same thing as last time. We have to get rid of that y, right? So there's got to be some other fact which will produce a formula I can use to substitute in for y. What other <coughs> fact haven't we used? Yeah, the volume is 7,000. The volume is 7. So volume is 7,000. What's the volume of a box? <coughs> length, width, height. Oh. So what's the length with height? It's x, x, and y, huh? x squared y is 7,000. Is that good for that equation? x squared y is 7,000. So we need to solve for y and plug it in. So divide by x squared. y is 7,000 over x squared. Plug it in. <coughs> We get to there. Last step. Can I clean that up a little bit? This is 4x over 1. So the x will cancel one of those x's. 4 times 7 is 28,000 over a single x. There we go. We're done. Everybody good with that last step? Right, because the 4x is over 1, so the x is canceled. You have 1x left in the bottom. 4 times 7 is 28,000. So we found a surface area formula in terms of x only. One more. You okay? Am I whipping too quick? This is going to be actually easier, although it looks bad. But they're giving you everything. So, okay, so on this one... Uh, we got like a soda can kind of shape, and they want us to figure out the cost of the materials to produce the soda can. So what's the, the cost? Well, it's going to be all the sides times the cost of the material for the sides. It says right here, the top, the top and the bottom is 9 cents per square centimeter. So the top is 0 0.09, and the bottom is 0 0.09. And the sides is 0.08, 8 cents. So that means you just take the formula for the top, pi r squared times 0.09, that's the top, plus the bottom is the same formula, pi r squared, they're giving it to you. That's for the bottom. And then the sides, they're giving you that one, 2 pi r h times 0.08, 
for the sides. <coughs> so we have the top, the bottom, and the sides all added up for the cost. Is that making sense what I'm doing there? You okay with that sides formula? Um, how'd they come up with that? Well, because if you have like a, a cylinder, like a soda can kind of shape, call that a right circular cylinder technically. Anyway, soda can kind of shape. You know, it's got a circle on the top, a circle on the bottom, pi r squared, pi r squared, right? And then what are the sides? Well, if you sliced it and opened it up, it's a rectangle, isn't it? Okay, and, and, and what are the two sides of the rectangle so we can find the area? Well, the height is just the height. That hasn't changed, right? However, however high the soda can was, that's still the height of the rectangle. No, no, no big deal there. But what about the width of the rectangle? Where did that come from? Well, that was how far around the top was. How far around is called circumference, 2 pi r. Not pi r squared. Pi r squared is area in the middle of the circle. 2 pi r is how far around the edge. They both have the same three players in the game, 2 pi and r. It's just for area, the 2 goes up in the power, pi r squared, right? It's good to know those two formulas for a circle. Area in the middle, pi r squared. Around the edge, 2 pi r. Right? Easy to remember, area is square units. So pi r squared for area. 2 pi r for circumference. So 2 pi r is how far around. That's the width. 2 pi r, h. That's the area for the side. That's all the sides, by the way. You don't have to go right left. That's the whole size, isn't it? That rectangle is the whole size. 2 pi r, h. That's what they're coming up with that formula. Times the cost. All right, so there's our formula. If I type that in, though, Math Excel is going to say, eh, you're wrong. Why? What's wrong? I mean, I, could, I guess I could add those two. Whatever, but it's not that. It wants only R, right? C of R. Always pay attention. We're always going to do a substitute thing, huh? It wants only R. Now, do I have only R? Pi, pi is 3.14. You, you, it doesn't have a problem with pi. Just, it probably, well, yeah, it says exact. I just want you to leave pi as pi. It's fine with pi. It has no problem with pi. It knows pi is really a number. But what does it have a problem with? H. That's a different letter it doesn't want. So we gotta do something about H. What other fact haven't we used? Where is that? Oh, right up there. Yeah. Volume is five hundred. Yep. Volume again. So volume, right over here. Volume is five hundred. Now, what's the volume of a soda can shit? Anybody know? <coughs> exactly. Yeah, for any shape that goes volume formulas are, are pretty simple. Any shape that goes same shape to same shape, like circle to circle, or you know, triangle to triangle, or what, any shape that's same to same, you just find that ground floor times the height. Right? Like, what if they had a circular building? And I said, hey, and it's some big building, circular, and I said, hey, there's, a, there's 30 offices in the ground floor. It's the same all the way up, 10 floors. How many offices? You'd go, well, 30 on the ground times 10 levels, 300. It's the same thing for volume, right? That just fills it up. Just find the ground times the height. That's how you do any same shape, same shape. So what's the ground? Pi r squared, it's a circle, times the height. So that's how you do all volume formulas that are same shape to same shape. Anyway, um, so there's our formula. We need to solve for h. Divide by pi r squared. Boom, h is that. Plug it in for h. Right? So what do we get? I'm going to add these two together. 0.09, put the 0.09 in the front if it bugs you. 0.09 pi r squared and 0.09, that's like 3x and 3x, 6x. 0.09 pi r squared and 0.09 pi r squared is 0.18 pi r squared, right? Just add the coefficient, add like terms, right? Plus 2 pi r h, what is h? It's this big mess here. 5,000 over pi r squared times 0.08. Good with that? So that's 0.18. Oh, it's 500. I'm adding zeros. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, what happens here? Pi's cancel. R cancels one of those R's. 2 times 0 0.08, 0 0.16 times 500. I don't know what that is. Uh, maybe I do. 160 times 5. 800? I think it's 800. Somebody verify that for me. 800 over R. Is that right? Am I doing that wrong? 1,000. Yeah, no, it's 80. Is it 80? It's 80. It's 80. Yeah, you know an easy way to know? 2 times 500 is what? 1,000. Multiply anything by 1,000, it doesn't go three places. 1, 2, 3. 
80. 80. 80, but you should use calculus one. 80, all these numbers both to be 80 over the R. Pi's canceled. R canceled one of those R. 80 over R. There we go. There's the cost formula in terms of R only. Is that good? Does that make sense? So now you need to type that into your calculator, right, as Y1. And the R will be like your X, right? You type in Y1 equals 0.18 times pi times X squared plus 80 over X. Graph it. Find the minimum. Is it minimum? Minimum. Right? And you'll find the soda can that holds the right volume and has the least cost in materials. Many companies are interested in this kind of thing, right? It's something people do. Real life calculation. They want to minimize their cost in materials and still hold a certain volume. Very, very useful. We're getting into some useful math here. Stuff people really do in the real world. Do you like that? Is that interesting? I often will get the question, you know, like I'm teaching Algebra 1 or something, and they'll go, Mr. Heron, where are we ever going to use this stuff? And I... I don't even know what to tell them at that point. I mean, you know, I always think, you know what it's like? You've got to get higher is the real answer. You've got to get higher, and then you see where, so here you are, things are getting useful. You're just on the cusp of when things start to get real. They're, you know, like a, a, a cylinder-producing company would want to use this kind of math to figure out how can we hold the volume with the cheapest possible can. They can save money, right? So when you're in the lower math classes, you know, it's kind of like being in Spanish 1, and raising your hand and saying, Where, who's ever going to use this in the real world? Well, that's a silly question, right? All kinds of people use Spanish in the real world. They write plays, they write books, they rank movies in Spanish. But you've got to get higher than Spanish 1 to be able to see some of those real-life things where Spanish is used. Same thing goes for math. It's a language that is used, but anyway. You guys aren't in Algebra 1. I won't give you the Algebra 1 spiel. All right. <laughs> All right, they're giving us a picture, and they're saying, hey, look at this picture. Where is the function, what are they saying to part A? Greater than zero. Where is the function? Part A, where is the function? Greater than zero. Now, you know function values are y values, huh? They're basically saying, where, where are the y values greater than zero? Well, look, look at that picture. That would be here. And that would be here. Right? Those are the places where it's above, where the y values are positive, huh? So those two sections are where the y values are greater than 0. So where is that? That's from 0 to 2. two, And from 3 off to infinity, right? You want me to erase my... You can see it a little bit better. See how it's between 0 and 2, right? Between 0 and 2... It's, it's y is greater than 0, and between 3 and forever to the right. Huh? So our answer would be, well, you want to know where y is greater than 0? Between 0 and 2, and between 3 and infinity. And those, they want intervals. So in those intervals, those sections, and those are all, th these are all x values, huh? Whenever they ask us for intervals, they mean x values. What sections of the x-axis? So between 0 and 2, and from 3 to infinity, the graph is above. Y is greater than zero. That good? And then part B, where is where are the Y values, or F of X, less than or equal to zero? <coughs> so where is the graph less than or equal to zero? So that would be here and here, huh? In those sections, it's below zero. All right, so that would be everywhere... In here and everywhere here, huh? So that's from negative infinity to zero and from two to three. Negative infinity to zero and two to three, the graph is below the axis. So we'll go negative infinity to zero and two to three. It's below. So far, so good. I've got to fix it with some brackets now. It's really not all parentheses like that. But are we generally good up to that point with how I'm finding the different sections where it's above or below by looking at the picture. Now, what about the brackets and stuff? Well, basically the story is this way. Wherever you have the equals bar, which would be part B, you're going to want to do brackets. Let me, let me put it. Bar leads to brackets. 
BB. Bar leads to price. Because when you have a bar, you're saying, I want to know where it's less than or equal. I want where it's, where's it equal to zero? Right on that spot, right on that spot, and right on that spot. Right? Right at those three spots. Right at zero, right at two, and right at three. It's right on the money zero, isn't it? Its height is right on zero. So at those three spots, it's equal to zero. Part A doesn't want equal to zero. They say, don't give me those. Just give me the places where it's greater. But part B says, yeah, I want those. So that means we turn this into a bracket. This is a bracket and this is a bracket because it wants those, doesn't it? And we never, we never put one on infinities because you're never right on infinity, right? Infinities always get parentheses. Good? So that's our answer. Those are our answers. Question? Yeah, part A was less than zero, so it's it's less. I mean, I mean sorry, part part B is less than or equal to zero, right? So it's less than or equal to zero from in this section from negative infinity, right? Because this graph goes down forever. So from negative infinity up to zero, and from two to three, including the endpoints, because they want less than or equal to zero. At the endpoints, it's equal to zero. Good there. Should try another one. That's just reading the graph. They're warming us up. They're going to give us like five or six or seven problems where they give us a nice picture. And they say, hey, look at that picture. Tell me where it's above. Tell me where it's below. And then they're going to suddenly give us equations that have no picture. And we have to, we have to do it ourselves without a picture. So as you're looking at this picture, be thinking in your mind, what's happening here and what I might do when there's no picture. How we're going to take a, a function itself and do this. That's where they're headed. The last 20 problems will do that. All right, so we got this one. So they're giving me this function, but they're showing me the picture. They're starting to ease me out. Now they're showing me the, the function and the picture. Couple, couple problems down the road, it's just the function, no picture. So there's the function, there's the picture. Go ahead and answer the question. They're only going to ask you one question, not an A and a B this time, just, just one part. F of X greater than or equal to zero. So find out where F of X is greater than or equal to zero. There, right, and there. Those are the greater than or equal to zero spots, right, sections. So in other words, it's everything from negative 2 forever to the right, isn't it? Negative 2 to infinity. Oh, and, and we want to put a bracket there, huh? Parenthesis on the infinity. Is that good? Everybody good with that answer? That's the true answer, right? But we have the bar, right? We're doing y greater than or equal to zero. So we have the bar, so we have the bracket. Not on the infinity, but on the number, right? Now, think with me for a second. How would we have done that if they didn't give us the picture? Because that's really where we're going for the last 20 problems or 18 problems or whatever. So let me redo this one. Let's do it without, without the picture. So what if they just gave me the y equals x plus 2, x minus 1 squared, and I didn't have the picture. I want to fly this plane blind. That's what they make you do when you learn how to fly, I've heard. Right? You look out the window for a while, and then their last few lessons is fly by the instruments without looking out the window. So, um, so how would we fly this plane? How would we answer this question if we had no window to look at? Just using the instruments. That's what we want to do. That's especially valuable as you're moving on in math to calculus and beyond, is being able to take a function like that function, and, and figure out a lot of things about it without a picture to look at. So, think with me. What you would, and we're trying to find out, they're asking, where is that greater than or equal to zero, right? That's the question. F greater than or equal to zero. Y greater than or equal to zero. So, somebody gave me that, no picture. How would I do it? How would I know enough information to figure it out? Well, first off, wouldn't I have to find these points right here? which is what, negative 2 and positive 1? Wouldn't I have to find those crucial points? Because that's where it changes, right? from being negative to being positive. And, and this one, at one, it turned out it went back up, but it could have gone down. So those are crucial places. Wherever it hits the x-axis, those are crucial places to figure out 
what's happening either side of those places, right? Where it's below and where it's above. Because in those places, it's going to change from being below to being above, or maybe it'll bounce, right? But those are the crucial places to find. How do I find those places? Yeah, those are where it, where it equals zero, huh? So you've got to basically take this equation they give you and set it equal to zero. So step one is make it equal to zero, huh? I know the original question is greater than or equal to, and I'll get to that. But first, I've got to find where it's right on the money zero, right? <coughs> and you can tell what, it's basically what makes these guys zero, huh? What makes this guy zero is negative two. What makes this guy zero is positive one, huh? So at negative two and positive one. So then we would right away go, oh, okay, negative two and positive one are the places it hits the x-axis, the x-intercepts. Then step two, I would go to the number line. If I didn't have the graph, I would go, well, I know it hits at negative 2 and positive 1. I know that much because the function is 0 at those two places. And then I would need to figure out what it's doing around those places, wouldn't I? And we've done some of this, right? Remember last, what was it, last month or maybe well, only like two weeks ago? Remember how we found end behavior? Remember how to do the end over here would be the end, right? What does it do at the end? What's the behavior at the end? Yeah, remember what you do is you, you multiply it out and use the biggest on screen, yeah, the biggest term. Remember that? The end, it's kind of like how we figure out horizontal asymptote. Or, right, we say, what happens way off to the right? What happens if you plug in 1,000? Well, remember, if you're plugging in really big numbers, if you're interested in the end behavior, all that matters is the most powerful term, right? The smaller ones get overwhelmed by the bigger term when you're plugging in really big numbers like 1,000 or a million, right? So, okay, if I was to multiply that all the way out, notice I don't want it foiled. Everybody, I, I don't want it foiled. I don't want it factored. So we're going we're gonna to do this dance between the factored form and the multiplied out form. You've got to kind of keep those straight. I want to say, if I was to multiply that out, right, multiply out, what would I have? What would be the front term? Be y equals x cubed, right? Because this would be x. I don't care about the plus 2. And this would be x squared. I don't care about the minus 1. That's nothing. And that would be positive x cubed, right? If I was to foil out that whole thing, just take the biggest term in each parenthesis, and multiply them, and you'll get what would be the biggest term in the front of the whole thing if it was all foiled out. The biggest term would be positive x cubed. So he's going to dominate the scene in the end, isn't he? So he's positive, so this graph is going up in the end, which is, sure enough, what's really true. I'm kind of graphing casually without doing the hard work of the whole graph, just getting what I need, right? So I know it's going up in the end. Now... We got to figure out at the one and at the negative two, is it going to bounce or pass through? Remember how we learned that a couple weeks ago? What determines whether a graph bounces or passes through a certain point? The power on the term in the factored version. Back to the factored version now, right? Remember, if it's even, I'll write it up here somewhere. If you're even power, then it's a bouncer. Right? Because remember, x squared, that's why x squared bounces like that. Right? But if you're an odd power, you pass through. Right? That's why x cubed passes through when he hits the axis, because he's odd. Whereas x squared bounces, right? Okay, so let's look back. At positive 1, that's this term. So, right, the positive 1 came from this term. What's the power on that term? It's even, so it's a bouncer. Boing, that's why it bounces there, which we see in the graph over here. Right, come back down to the 2 now. What's the 2, or the negative 2, I mean, came from this term. What's the power on that one? Positive 1, odd. Nothing but a 1 power there. So it's going to pass through because it's odd. So that's generally what the graph looks like, pretty close to what the real graph is. See how we figure that out? Right? End behavior, bounce, pass through, like we did before. Now, why does all that help us? Because now we can easily figure out where's the thing greater than zero? Here and here, which we already did. 
So that's how you would do it if they gave you no picture. Questions I can answer on that? So step one, set it equal to zero. Step two, put those on a number line. And then step three, find the end behavior and the pass-through bounds. All right, so there we go. Now, it's going to be a little bit of a different story when we have a fraction. So the story I just gave you about finding word zero, going to the number line, doing the end behavior and the pass-through bounds, that works great for the ones that are not fractions. There's about half of them. About half of the questions in the last 18 or whatever are going to not be fractions. And so what we just did is everything you need when they're not a fraction. And now let me show you how you do it when there's a fraction. When there's a fraction, the difference is you end up with vertical asymptote lines as a place where the graph goes from negative to positive. You see that? Am I talking too much, too fast at you? You see what I'm saying? Remember, we have, to, we have to find not only where the function equals zero, which would be right here. That's where it hits zero, huh? But where it's got verticals here and here at 2 and 0. Because at all those places, it can switch its sign. The graph can go from being below to being above. From being below to being above. From being above, switch to below. At verticals and at an x-intercept. They're all important, aren't they? They're all possible changing spots where it changes its mind from being above to being below. Nowhere else. You see, see the issue? We're basically saying, hey, if I could just find out the only places where this graph might change its mind, get those on the graph, and then figure out where it is, then I can just kind of trace it back if I know the only places it can change its mind. Right? So the only places are the x equals 0, I'm mean, sorry, the y equals 0, the x-intercept, and then the vertical. So how do you find all those? Let's, let's do that. So for a fraction... It's a little bit more. Step one is, uh, well, let me, let, me, let me ask you this. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to say, kind of erase my mess here. Um, I want to say, I want to find this point right here. That point is where the height of the function is zero, right? You guys with me? Where's the height of the function zero? How do you, how do you take a fraction like x minus one over x, x minus two, and say, I want to know where u equals zero? I want to know where u equals zero, Mr. Fraction. How does a fraction become zero? Think with this is really important, guys. This goes on into calculus. The top part is equal to zero. Does a fraction, a fraction, with the top and the bottom <coughs> becoming zero, only depend on the top being zero? Yes. Is that clear in your mind? It has nothing to do with the bottom. So he's right. You all know that? Really important. I remember teaching calculus and my students having great trouble. You do some things called derivatives and you do where the top and bottom is zero. I remember everybody, everybody but like half my class struggling on one test when I, I had them find where some fraction thing was zero. And um, they were, they, and, I, and I was surprised that they didn't already know that. So now's the time to learn that. And it caused them all kinds of problems because they did crazy stuff with the job. I remember reading that test book. What are they doing with the denominator? It has nothing to do with the that function. It's clear in their mind at this point. So you need to know the only way a fraction can become zero is if the top is zero, right? It has nothing to do with the bottom, right? Zero over like zero over seven. What is that? Zero. Doesn't matter about the bottom. Now what if the bottom is zero? What is that? That's undefined. That's not zero. That's just craziness, right? So everybody with me? The only way a fraction is zero is if the top is zero. It has nothing to do with the bottom. All right, so you want to be crystal clear on that. Make your life a lot easier in calculus. I don't need to mess with the bottom. It has nothing to do with the bottom. All right, so, so that's why I say just numerator zero. That's what will find this point, right? That's the point where the function has a height of zero, where the numerator is zero. So that just means x minus 1 is zero, so that's easy. That's x is 1, so this must be at x is 1. Step two, now I, I, need, now I need to find the vertical asymptotes. And how do I find the verticals? Denominator. denominator zero. Right? That's where you find the vertical. We already know that from previous work. So what's the denominator? X times X minus 2. So you separate the numerator zero and the denominator zero. Those are all going to be crucial points. So this is X is zero or X is positive 2, huh? 
Now, all those, step three, now you go to the number line with all of those spots. So we have what? Zero, one, and two. And remember, the zero and the two are verticals, aren't they? Because they make the denominator zero. They're not allowed. They're not in the domain. They're verticals. Okay. So now <laughs> we have to figure out which of those are, where, where, where the graph is going to be positive and negative around those three locations. It can't change its mind anywhere else, just between those spots. Okay, so I'm going to go to a new screen if that's okay, because we got a little more work to do on this one. All right, so, so what have we determined? We got x equals 1 from the top. We got x equals 0 and 2 from the bottom. That has led us to the number line. 0, 1, and 2, with verticals at 0 and verticals at 2. Now, so this is an important point also. Now we have to determine in each of these sections, uh, meaning this section, this section, this section, and that section. There's four sections, right? Because that one is a separator as well. We have to determine in each of these sections if the function is above or below. Now we know because we got the picture. But I would say, if you didn't have the picture, which is what's going to happen in the last 18 questions, how would we know whether it's above or below, above or below, in each of those sections? Well, you could do the in. For the in, you could still just do the in behavior, if you want. That'll still work. So let's do, how about that? Want to do the in behavior? Again, I mean, there's options. There's other things. You could just plug in a value. Maybe we should just do that. I, let, let's just plug in values. When it comes to the fraction one, I believe in just plugging in values mainly because, um, well, uh, you, I can't, the problem is I can't do all the uh, bounce pass through stuff. I can't do that at a vertical. Did you hear what I'm saying? See, normally I like to just get the end. Well, maybe I'm confusing you. So I could just do the end. Here, let's do the end behavior. I'll just do the end. So, what's the end behavior of this function? Most powerful term on the top, most powerful term on the bottom x over x squared, that good? It's positive, it's positive 1 over x. I don't care that it's 1 over x or x over 1. All I care is it's positive. All I care about that is the sign. Nothing more is of interest to me. Don't look at that 1 over x and think all kinds of other things that we did with 1 over x. That doesn't matter right now. I'm just determining positive or negative. Positive. Now, now it really doesn't look quite like that, as we can tell from the picture, but good enough, that's all I care about. It's positive. It's above the axis to the right of 2 in the end. In the end, it's above. Now, how do I know it couldn't come down again later? How do I know it can't come down and cross the axis again? Okay, couldn't it do this first and then go positive eventually? No. There'd be another x-intercept. We found all the intercepts. We found all the places. It'd have to hit zero here. It'd have to be the height. The only way to make this function zero is if the top is zero. That's only at x equals one. It's never going to do that again. Right? You see the strength of our method. So we can rely on these instruments. They're trustworthy. You can put your confidence in them, right? There's no other place that function hits zero. We're confident. The only place it's going to do that is x equals one. So no. If it's positive in the end, it's always positive in the end, right? It's always up here, which, sure enough, that's what the graph says, too. But we know it. We don't need the graph. We know it. It can't come down again. All right. Now, what does it do right at 2? Well, who knows? We, we can't do the pass-through bounce because it doesn't even hit 2. Right? You don't even touch a vertical asymptote. So this is where there's really not a lot of choices, guys. You have to plug in a value. You just have to plug in. So for this section here, I've just got to put in a value. What's a number between 1 and 2? Yeah, how about right here, 1.5, or 1.4, 1.6, whatever. Just put in something between 1 and 2. I've got to test that region. Do you see why I have to do this and I didn't have to do this? Because at a vertical asymptote, I can't do the pass-through bounce thing because it doesn't even hit there. All right, so plug in 1.5. Plug in what? To the original function. The y equals x minus 1 over x times x minus 2. Plug in the 1.5 there, there, and there. What are you going to get? 1.5 minus 1 over 
times 1.5 minus 2. Everybody good so far? So I plugged in the 1.5, those three spots. 1.5, 1.5, 1.5. Now, I, you can type it on your calculator if you want, but really, remember, I don't care about the number. All I care about is what? Positive or negative? Above or below? Because that's all they're going to ask me. Then. Where's it above or where's it below? I don't care what the particular number is. I'm just trying to find if this section between 1 and 2 is an all up or an all down. Because it's one or the other. It doesn't cross in between, right? It crosses at 1 and, and, and not again until 2, right? Nothing else happens. So if it's up at 1.5, it's up all the way between 1 and 2. If it's down at 1.5, it's down all the way between 1 and 2. It's the power of our instruments, right? So is that thing positive or negative? What's the top? Positive. What's the bottom? Positive times negative. Right? This is positive. This is negative. So positive over positive times negative. What's that? Positive over negative. What's that? Negative. It's negative, which sure enough, it is negative in that section, isn't it? It is negative. It's down here. It's negative in that section. See that? Now, I could do the pass-through bounce thing at 1. <coughs> Probably an easy way to go. At 1, is it going to pass through or bounce? Because it does hit there. How do you know? Look back to the, the term from which the 1 came. Look at the power on that term. Is it odd or even? It's just first power, odd. It's odd. It's a pass-through. So it's going to go up like this. So I don't even need to check the other section. Is that good? It's got to do that. Finally, out here, I need to check. Because I, I don't know what it's going to do at zero. Zero is a vertical asymptote. It could be up. It could be down. It could do all kinds of things. You've got to plug in some number out here and figure out whether it's above in that whole section or below in that whole section. What's a number to the left of zero? Like negative one. Plug it in. Y equals X minus one over X times X minus two. Plug in negative one. Plug in negative one. So you get negative one minus one over negative one. Times negative 1 minus 2. I, all I care is it's negative over negative times negative. All I care is about the signs, right? Negative over negative times negative. So that's three negative signs. What is it? Three negative signs? <laughs> it's negative, right? Sure enough, see, it is negative down there. Somehow it's down here. Whew, what a mess. So see how I figured that out without the graph? And it agrees with the graph as far as where it's above and where it's below. So now I can answer the final question. What's their final question? Where is that function less than zero? Where is that function below zero? Here? Well, let me do a different color or something. It's getting so messy. Here, right? Because the graph's down there. And down here, so here. Those two sections, it's below zero, isn't it? So that's what? That's from negative infinity to zero and from one to two. Would zero be a bracket There's no solid bar, so there's no brackets on anything. Now, the only time you get brackets is if they give you less than or equal or greater than or equal. Only the bar leads to brackets. No bar, no brackets for sure. All right, so our answer is going to be negative infinity to zero, <coughs> comma, one to two. All parentheses. Is that good? See how we did all that? We got, let's do one more. We've got to use these last three minutes. One tip. What if there had been less, less than or equal to? What if they'd asked us less than or equal to? Well, then I would make all these brackets that I could. Now, what do I mean that I could? Well, you never put a bracket on an infinity. But you also don't put a bracket on values you can't go to, like vertical asymptotes. So you never put a bracket on a vertical asymptote because you can't hit it. So I would not put a, a bracket on 0 or 2. But 1 would get a bracket. Does that make sense? So only the 1 would actually get a bracket if they had said less than or equal to. 2 is a vertical. The 0 is a vertical. They can never be touched. And the infinity can't be touched. All right, we'll wrap up with this non-fractioner here. All right, so take that one. So, so now the rest of the problems from 8 through 26, yeah, is that 18 problems, something like that? It's actually 19 problems, I think. 
There, um, 19 problems, there are no pictures. They just give you equations and ask you to solve it. So try that one. So go through the steps that we were talking about. Step one. Find out what makes it equal zero. What makes it equal zero? Negative six and positive nine, right? Step two. Number line. <coughs> All right, so now this one is not a fraction, so we can just do it the easy way. Just do the end behavior and then the pass through or bounce for each of those. And we'll find out if it's above or below. And then we can answer the final question. So what's the end Behavior at the end, <coughs> it's y equals positive x. Right? If you were to multiply this out, remember it's always about, if you were to multiply it all the way out, what would be the front term, the most powerful term? Positive x cubed, right? Because it's x squared times x to the first, right? x squared, x to the first, positive x cubed. So it's going up, 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 off to the end. At the end, it's positive. It's above. <coughs> Is that good? Now, figure out, is 9 a pass-through or a bounce? And is negative 6 a pass-through or a bounce? Look at, look at the 9 first off. Here's the 9. What's the power on him? 1, so it's odd. So it passes through. It's odd. Passes through, comes back up to the minus 6. Minus 6 a pass through or a bounce? It's even. It's even. So it's going to bounce. Boing, go back down, huh? Is that good? How we got that information? Now, now we're ready to answer the final question. Where is that function greater than 0? The y value is greater than 0. Yeah, from, it's, that's the section, huh? From 9 to infinity. Do we put brackets? No, they just, they had no, no, no bar. We put no brackets, all parentheses. From 9 to infinity. See, we did that without ever seeing a picture. We basically kind of got the picture to some levels. All right, well, we didn't finish this. We got to do more. It's a big, long section. We're only like maybe halfway done. So all we finished then was the other one for...